Liz Truss, former British Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary. Welcome to Taiwan Talks. Great to be here. I understand you are enjoying your freedom. So how does it feel to be in Taiwan? It's great. Uh, as you know, because of the various protocols, UK government ministers, certainly cabinet ministers, aren't really able to travel to Taiwan. But it's something I've always wanted to do. Taiwan is a beacon of freedom and democracy. I'm a great believer that we need to make sure that Taiwan's able to defend itself, that we build free societies and support free societies around the world. So it's great to be able to come here and see it in real life mm. and experience the commerce, the industry, the buzz uh, that there is here. Now, China's envoy to the UK has called your trip a dangerous political show, which will do nothing but harm to the UK. Do you read that as a threat? What I read this as is Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party trying to prevent people visiting Taiwan, engaging with Taiwan, talking about Taiwan. And we know why that is. It's because President Xi has been very clear that his ambition is to take over Taiwan. So he wants to do that in the way that causes the least disruption as possible. And I don't believe we should accept the rhetoric from the Chinese Communist Party in the free world. Instead, we should be actively seeking to engage Taiwan, bring Taiwan into the conversation, celebrate what is a free democracy 80 miles away from a totalitarian regime, which is what, which is what China has regrettably become. Mm. But some in the British press have also criticised your visit. Um, they say that you are using Taiwan to rebuild your career. Are you? Well, again, I would say of my friends in the British press, you know, they benefit from operating in a free society, which people in China don't benefit from. And I just think the press have got to be very careful about repeating the lines to take of the Chinese Communist Party. What we know is that the Chinese Communist Party uses misinformation and disinformation to try and discredit their opponents, those who believe in free societies. And I just don't think we should have any truck with any of the propaganda they spout. So critics of high-level visitors to Taiwan will say that the, visit the visits are purely symbolic and they don't bring real benefits to Taiwan. What, what's your view on visits per se? Well, I've been invited by the Taiwan authorities and I believe that they are in a position to understand what is best from a Taiwanese perspective. But the reason I've come is after 10 years of not being able to visit Taiwan, I wanted to see for myself what things are like here, what the people of Taiwan want, what the authorities want, so that we are able to work more closely with Taiwan. And I don't believe if you've never visited a country, or you've never visited a, you know, a democracy like Taiwan, how can you know what's happening here? And that is the deliberate intention of the Chinese Communist Party, is to stop that happening, to stop people having that experience, to stop them being able to engage. And again, to me, this is part of a propaganda effort, and we should, we should ignore that. You've said Taiwan is the most consequential place in the world, in the most consequential struggle of our time. Could you explain what this means? Well, we're facing a real threat to freedom and democracy. 30 years ago, more people lived in democracies than they do today. And I find that very worrying. We've now got China is the world's largest economy on a purchasing parity power basis, growing its armaments, growing its military, growing its economic influence around the world. I believe there is a threat to the future of freedom and democracy. And if you look at that threat and what the tipping point could be, Taiwan is very, very important. Of course, it's important because 
it's a free democracy and we support people in free democracies and I want people in Taiwan to live happy, free lives where they're able to decide their own futures rather than being told what to do. I think that's important in itself. But it's also important because of the shipping routes in the Taiwan Strait. It's important because of the critical mineral supplies that the global economy depends on. And it's important because of the huge signal it would send if China were successful in taking over Taiwan. Now, I've been on the inside as I've seen the build up to the war in Ukraine. And I think what we all recognize now in the West is we didn't do enough early enough. Putting more economic controls on Russia, which we should have done. Not allowing Russia to do things like attend the G8. Failing to respond adequately when there were incursions in Crimea or when there were you know, support for action in the Donbass. We didn't do enough. And we're now facing the consequences. When I say we're facing the consequences, it's actually the people of Ukraine who are facing the dreadful consequences of that. So this is why I'm so exercised that we need to do more as we can see this emerging threat to take action before it is too late and before the situation gets worse. And yet politicians like Macron, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, um, says essentially Taiwan is not a core interest for Europe. Well, I, I, I completely disagree with that. I think that's, that's wrong. That if we look at the threat to freedom and democracy across the world, the number one threat is an increasingly powerful totalitarian China. And supporting the free democracy 80 miles from the coast from China is to me a vital part of making sure China doesn't succeed in its ambitions. And let's be clear, those ambitions aren't just territorial, they're ideological. You know, President Xi wants to promote a different way of life to the one that we believe in. You know, a top-down, controlling, coercive version of the world, not a free, bottom-up, democratic, people-led version of the world. And I, I think that's wrong. And I think we've got to be clear about that. It doesn't matter that Taiwan is in a different part of the world. It hasn't stopped China interfering in European politics, the fact that we're at the other side of the world. And likewise, the war in Ukraine is having knock-on effects for people here in the Pacific. Of course it is. We can't just ignore a problem just because it's far away. So you say that there is no choice, the world has no choice about whether there is a Cold War, because China has already made up its mind. And you say that the only choice we have is either to appease and accommodate China or to take action to prevent conflict. So which countries do you view as appeasing and accommodating China? Well, I think to some extent, every or virtually every country in the free world is not doing enough at the moment. I think we've moved. I think things are better than they were in the so-called golden era, where we were actively seeking closer economic ties with China. But it's still the case that technology is being exported to China, which is being used against its own citizens. It's still the case that we don't have a coordinated group of countries that is clear on its economic action vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think we all, we all need to do more. And what I've been saying today is really a call to action for the free world of, yes, measures have been taken, but we need to do more. And we need to be more coordinated because the Chinese Communist Party is very adept at playing one country off against another or even trying to exacerbate internal divisions within countries. And we need to be very alive to that and aware of that. And we need to work together because what we have in common 
our way of life, our belief in freedom and democracy is more important than any internal divisions that we have. So one of your policies, suggested policies, is an economic NATO. Can you tell us how this would work? So during the Cold War, there was a committee on exports, which was a group of countries that had a common policy on their exports towards the Soviet Union. What I want to see is a grouping of countries that has a common policy on technology exports towards China, action in the case of economic coercion. So we've seen Australia subject to economic coercion, we've seen Lithuania subject to economic coercion. So this would be a coordinating response in the event of economic coercion by China, this committee could take action with all of those countries involved. And if you look at what we've done on an ad hoc basis already with Russia, a group of countries has come together to put sanctions on Russia. So that's the G7, the EU, plus allies like South Korea, Australia. What I'm saying is rather than waiting for something bad to happen, instead we should preemptively establish such a grouping so that we are able to show that we're serious. And I think that will help deter conflict. I think prevention is better than cure. It's better to show we're ready. It's better to show we're coordinated and not have any beggar my neighbor policies between free countries, but instead have a coordinated approach. In the US, there was a bill that was put forward called the Taiwan Policy Act. And in there, some of the congressmen had suggested sanctions, um, economic sanctions against China in order to deter an invasion, and it didn't get through. What sort of likelihood or what sort of appetite are you feeling amongst the people that you talk to you know, for establishing this sort of mechanism? Well, I think there are differences of opinion on this issue, but we have already seen countries put restrictions on exports to China. So, for example, the US and the Netherlands have done that with respect to the technology. In the UK, we now have investment screening in place to make sure that we don't have investment from concerning sources. We've also limited high-risk vendors in our telecoms network. So we've stopped Huawei having a major part of our telecoms network. So there has been action taken by individual countries. What I'm arguing for is a greater level of coordination uh, between countries to make sure we're acting in concert because I think that is much more powerful. I think it's unrealistic to say that the UK is going to be able to deal with this alone or Australia is going to deal with this alone. But if you look at the combined economies of the G7 plus the EU, it's over half of the world's GDP. That is a powerful block and we should use that consciously and coherently to deter bad behaviour and encourage good behaviour. I mean, when, within the UK itself, your position obviously differs to that of the current Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly. Uh, he says that no significant global problem can be solved without China. He's listed climate change, economic instability, nuclear proliferation, uh, and that to give up on dialogue with China would be giving up on addressing humanity's greatest problems. What do you say to that? Let, let me be clear, I, I always support talking. So I, I fully support dialogue with China. I'm not arguing against talking to China. What I'm saying though, is that we can't trust what China commits to. So if you look at the 1984, agreement on Hong Kong. That agreement has been trampled over by China. They've introduced a national security law in Hong Kong and people's liberties in Hong Kong have been diminished. So what I'm saying is that we can't trust commitments that are made. And I think we have to be very careful on issues like climate change where we've seen China continue to invest in coal-fired power stations. They've actually put more, I think they've authorised more new coal-fired power stations so far in 2023 than they did in the whole of 2021. 
I think we've got to take that with a, with a pinch of salt. But I'm not arguing against talking to China. I'm saying the number one issue that we face is the threat to freedom and democracy, and that should be our priority. You also say that the UK, now that it has entered the trade bloc, the CPTPP, should help block China and help Taiwan's entry. So from your time in, you know, as Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, also in the Trade Department, how much support is there for, for this in the UK? Well, there is, I believe, huge support in the UK for taking a tougher stance on China. I've got no doubt about that. And I think opinion has shifted significantly since we went through uh, the so-called golden era. Now, I think it's got further to go. And this is why I'm making these speech. This is why my colleagues make similar speeches. This is why we need to make the case. Because I think people are waking up to the threat, but I don't think there is a full level of awareness about exactly what it is or how close it is. And one of the reasons that I'm so pleased the UK has joined the CPTPP is it's a really important geostrategic act to have countries that support the rules-based system working together. And we need more of that. And we need, we need countries and territories that are part of CPTPP that support that. You're the highest level British MP since Margaret Thatcher visited Taiwan in the 1990s to come here. Now, the Iron Lady, she's known for her toughness, but also caution. How do you think she would handle China if she were PM today? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, in terms of the CPTP. I think it's, I think it's a very difficult question to answer because we're in very different times from the times that we were facing in the, in the 1980s. But if you look back at the challenges that we faced then, the challenges were industrial decline in the West, as well as a rising concern about the USSR. And what, what you saw then is a very strong alliance of democracies, including the US, including uh, the United Kingdom, but also our allies like Japan and Australia to challenge what the USSR were trying to do. So, I, I, as I've said, I think this is something that can't be solved by the UK alone. I think we can be part of it. But what we need is that strong sense of alliance that there is more in common between free democracies than divide us. And we urgently need to work together because we're not winning the argument at the moment. You know, there are fewer people living in free democracies than there were 30 years ago. There are countries who are now signing new agreements with China, whether those are security agreements or trade agreements, because they feel that is the way the wind is blowing. That is the reality of the situation we're in now. And if we don't do more today, I very much fear we will regret that in action tomorrow. And that's what I'm saying. Yes, you said that the opportunity to confront China is now because I think you said in five or 10 years that opportunity may not be here because China would be even more powerful and even more economically uh, integrated. Uh, Taiwan's legislative speaker, Yoshi Kun, is in Washington now. And he said that if we don't take China's threat seriously, a dark future awaits all of mankind. What do you believe that future would hold? Well, I'm a, I'm a realist, but I'm also an optimist. And I do believe that freedom and democracy are the best way and that we can win this argument and we can successfully transform our economies and we can successfully take on the economic coercion that we're seeing from China. But I do agree that the alternative is very dark. And I think it's very significant that it's people in places like 
Eastern Europe, the Baltic states and Poland, who've had a recent experience of living under authoritarian regimes who are most exercised by the threat. And that is the message I think we have to get across more widely, that this is a real threat and it is a threat to our way of life and it is a threat to those things that we took for granted. At the end of the Cold War, I think a lot of us believed that freedom was forever, that we were on a permanent path to greater prosperity, that it was fine to cut our defence budgets because there was no real threat out there. That is clearly not a world we're living in now. And You've made the link between you know, Europe and, and Asia. Uh, and currently, China is saying that it can be a peacemaker in Ukraine. You mentioned you know, Eastern Europeans and how they understand the threat because of Russia. Um, what, do you, what do you make of China's peacemaking efforts? And there's something that you said in a speech where you said that China mustn't be given leverage over Europe. What did you mean by that? I'm, I'm very skeptical, to be honest. I mean, clearly, decisions about Ukraine are for the Ukrainian leadership and President Zelensky. And that, that's important. You know, these are the people who are facing a truly horrific war and you know, losing, losing lives, you know, huge human cost in Ukraine. So ultimately, it has to be President Zelensky's decision about any agreement he wishes to come to. What I'm saying, though, is that I am sceptical that involving China will help in this scenario. Ultimately, the best way to help Ukraine is to give them the weapons they need to be able to push Russia out of Ukraine. And that is the only way uh, we're going to get to a long-term solution uh, to end that conflict. And given uh, what China has been doing in, in the Pacific, I'm very sceptical that they will be of great assistance in Europe. So you um, advocate more arms or enough arms to Ukraine to help them win the war. Uh, you also talk about allowing Ukraine to enter NATO. So we have talked in this interview about how difficult it is to get the message through to, to partners, to allies you know, about the threat and what we collectively need to do about that. Again, NATO will be meeting in Vilnius, in Lithuania in July. What's the likelihood of steps being taken to allow Ukraine to enter NATO? Well, we've already made progress in that Finland, Sweden are now joining NATO. That is very positive. And there are discussions taking place about what more security guarantees can be provided to Ukraine. But what I would like to see as a pathway for their NATO membership. I mean, if Ukraine had been able to join NATO when they'd applied, you know, earlier, or decade, roughly a decade ago, then we would not be in the situation we're in now. And so I do think there needs to be a pathway I don't know exactly what will be agreed at the Vilnius summit, but what I want to see is progress on the long-term security guarantee for Ukraine. And moving back to Taiwan, um, before you became PM, you were in favor of the UK selling arms to Taiwan. Are you still in favor of this? Do you believe that there should be more countries around the world, not just the US? to sell arms to Taiwan? Well, what the US do is they, they provide arms to Taiwan, whereas what the UK does is we license equipment. Again, similarly to the economic side, what I think we should do is coordinate with our allies, understand what is needed to help the Taiwanese defend themselves. And yes, we should be prepared to allow that equipment to go to Taiwan. It, Taiwan is a free democracy. It has every right to defend itself. And I believe that 
making sure that it is able to defend itself helps prevent conflict. It's a deterrence. The next UK general election uh, must be held before January 2025. Now, you're only 47 years old. Uh, do you plan to stand? I like the way you say <laughs> only 47, that's nice. I absolutely, stand, I absolutely am planning to stand in the, in the forthcoming election. At the Heritage Foundation in Washington, you said that you had had a major setback, but that you cared too much about the agenda to give it, give it up and that in the next few months you'll be setting out the ideas of how to take the battle forward. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Well, what I, what I mean is that, first of all, I care deeply about the future of freedom across the world. And one of the things I've been doing here in Taiwan is setting out what I think the free world needs to do to take on the challenge of a growing growingly aggressive China. I think that is one of the key things that we need to do and I will carry on making that case and working with allies around the world to make that And we're making progress, but we're not making progress fast enough. And the second thing we need to do is making sure that democracy and free societies work for people in our countries. Now, in Taiwan, there's been 3.2% growth for the last decade or so. Including over the pandemic. That is something that we look on with envy in countries like the United Kingdom and across Europe. And we need to get our economies growing. Because if we are going to challenge authoritarian regimes, we need to show that living in a free democracy gives opportunities and improves living standards. So the other issue I'm focused on is how do we generate that economic growth? And I will be saying more about that in due course. Liz Truss, thank you so much thank for you your time much. today. Thank you very much. Thank you.